श्री गौर पूर्णिमा महामहोत्सव की जय जय श्री चैतन्य जय नित्यानंद जय द्वैत चंद्र जय गौर भक्त वृंद जय जय श्री चैतन्य जय नित्यानंद जय द्वैत चंद्र जय गौर भक्त वृंद जय जय श्री चैतन्य जय नित्यानंद जय द्वैत चंद्र जय गौर भक्त वृंद today we we'll start the ppt in a minute it's a very auspicious day of the appearance day of shri gaurang mahaprabhu and i'll be continuing the talk that i had started yesterday on how shri chaitanya mahaprabhu changed the course of indian history so since i believe was anyone from today's who is there today was there yesterday in yesterday's class okay Okay, about two, or three, four. So I'll quickly summarize what I discussed, and hopefully the PowerPoint will also start in a minute or two. So broadly, there are different ways of appreciating certain events in history, certain characters in history, or in general people. So there is, if we today are celebrating the appearance day of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. so sometimes the significance of an event is understood immediately it is it is earth shaking say a war happens a major war happens then there are a lot of ramifications of the war right now a war is happening between ukraine and russia rat russia is attacking ukraine and then we see on social media and on the internet the images of cities being uh, wrecked and buildings being destroyed so some events are significant and their significance is seen immediately mm. on the other hand some other events they are significant but their significance comes out gradually so why is that because those events are acting more at a subtle level so for example if there is a shifting of the tectonic plates under the earth now that shifting may be happening gradually but nobody may be aware of it but eventually the tectonic plate shifting will become so big that there will be a catastrophic earthquake above so from the moment that the shifting started to the quake time of the quake happening there are two very different things so what we are so similarly mahaprabhu appeared and the chain of events that he triggered is going on even now and if we look at it in broad historical context then we can ap appreciate the significance of mahaprabhu's appearance and the chain of events that started from that point of view so we can appreciate things by going deeper into them that's one way and then we can appreciate things by looking at them from a broader perspective so if i want to understand how if you suppose somebody wants to buy a house one way to look at okay go inside the house look at everywhere in the house how the walls are how the rooms are and if it's a big house somebody is planning to start a business and they want to have a proper multi story office look at it properly from inside go deep inside it look at all the materials look at the foundation another is look at it from a broader perspective okay what locality is then situated in what kind of people are there in the neighborhood you know what is the safety level what is the prosper financial level of the people around so we go deeper to understand and we look broader to understand both are ways of understanding so in today's talk i'll be focusing on looking going broader to understand mahaprabhu's appearance and its significance 
So let's begin. This is Adilila, 13th chapter, 122nd verse. Now in the Chaitanya Charitamrit, there is a philosophical discussion from chapters 1 to 12. It's more of a contextualization. The 12 chapters are giving a more or less like an introduction to the characters, explaining who they are and what their significance is. So after that, in the 13th chapter, the actual Leela starts. So would anyone like to recite this verse? We'll do it responsibly. Yes. One will ask would like to? Or any, anyone else? Yes. <coughs> Aiche Prabhu Shachi Ghare Kripaya Kaila Vatare Aiche Prabhu Shachi Ghare Kripaya Kaila Vatare E Iha Kara Yeshravana E Iha Kara Yeshravana Gaura Prabhu Dayamaya Tare Haya Sadaya Gaura Prabhu Dayamaya Tare Haya Sadaya Sei Paya Tara Charana Sei Paya Tara Charana so, Aiche Prabhu. Aiche means in this way, Prabhu Shachi Ghare. In the house of Shachi Mata. It is interesting, it doesn't say Jagannath Ghare, Shachi Ghare. The home is generally the ruling place of the wife, of the woman, Shachi Ghare. And in her womb also, that is also another meaning of the word Ghare. Bhakti Vinod Thakur in his Amrit Prabhabhashya explains that. In her womb he appeared. Krupaya Kaila Avatare. He descended to the world out of his great mercy. Yei iha karaya shravana. Now please hear this pastime of Mahaprabhu's descent to this verse. He has descended out of mercy. The Lord's descent has broadly two purposes. As Krishna describes in the Bhagavad Gita, in four, first he describes the first purpose in 4, 7 and 8. And then the second purpose he describes in 4, 9. So 4, 7 and 8 describes the famous verse Yada Yada Hi Dharmasya Klanir Bhavati Bharata Abhyutthana Madharmasya Tadatmanam Srajamyaham Paritranaya Sadhunam Vinasha Chadushkutam Dharma Samstapana Arthaya Sambhavami Yuge Yuge That is to establish Dharma. The next verse describes another purpose. That is Janma Karma Chame Divyam Evam Yoveti Tatvataha Tyaktva Deham Punar Janma Naiti Mameti So Arjuna and then what happens? They come to me. How do they come to me? Because their heart becomes filled with love for me. Vitaragabhaya Krodha Manmaya Mamupashrita Bahavo Gyana Tapasa Puta Madhava Magataha. So there are two purposes to establish dharma in the world and to establish bhava in the heart. Dharma in the world. Dharma here refers to order. The Lord comes to establish order in the world. And he comes to establish love in the heart. And both these purposes are important. At one level, the first purpose is timely. The second purpose is timeless. What do I mean by that? The Lord comes at a particular time and he establishes dharma at that particular time. But the nature of the world is sakale neha mahata yogonashtaha parantapa. By the power of time, everything that is constructed will be deteriorated and destroyed. So even the order that the Lord establishes, that will, that will be deteriorated by the passage of, pass, passage of time. So in that sense, the first purpose is, is time-centered. It happens at a particular time. But the second purpose is timeless. That bhav, establishing love in the heart, that the Lord can do at all times. Even when he is not personally manifest in the world, just by remembering his appearance, Bhavesmin Klishyamananam, Kunti Maharani describes in her prayers, she gives various theories about why the Lord appears. And finally she gives her understanding. Why does the Lord appear? Bhavesmin Klishyamananam, Avidya Kama Karma Bhi, Shravan Smarana Arhani, he says that the Lord appears to give for time immemorial people resources for hearing about him, for remembering him and thus becoming attracted to him. And in that way, we all can become, develop bhava, love in the heart. So, 
Sometimes people say, when is, there is so much disorder, so much chaos in the, in the world. When is God going to come? When is he going to establish order in the world? Well, the fact is that even when the Lord was present on the world, on the earth, it is not that there was order in every corner of the world. Because the nature of the world, is disorder will be there. So rather than waiting when God will establish dharma, order in the world, we can focus on working with the Lord in establishing bhava in our heart, in establishing love in our heart. And that is the primary mission of Mahaprabhu. So, Gaura Prabhu Dayamaye. So, Krupaya Kaila Avatar. So, what is his Krupa? If you start thinking his Krupa will be, oh, when will the Lord descends and the whole world becomes an orderly place? Well, that is not going to happen. This is Kali Yuga. Things are going to glide downwards. But that doesn't mean everything is dark. See, the, the, the glory of the Lord's mercy is that although the world may be on a downward trajectory, the heart can be on an upward trajectory. The consciousness can be on an upward trajectory. And that is the transcending power of the Lord's mercy. So Krupa, that is the Krupa. Gaura Prabhu Dayamai. He is extremely merciful. So, what happens is, he is not only merciful, Sadaya, but if somebody hears about him, the Lord's mercy becomes even more manifested. Like a person might be very charitable. But then, if some, the, the charitable person sees someone who is needy, someone who is poor in front of them, then that charitable spirit that is there in the heart becomes manifest. And then, they give charity generously. So similarly, the Lord is always merciful. But, if somebody hears about him, so our hearing about him is our way of showing our eagerness to connect with him. Then, so the Lord's mercy becomes manifest and when that mercy becomes manifest then we attain his lotus feet. We, we progress steadily towards attaining his lotus feet. So this, in terms of the devotional literature Mahaprabhu's descent is the most momentous event in the entire span of Kali Yuga. In fact, we can go further and say that Mahaprabhu's descent is, is unprecedented in the entire history of the universe. Because, as it is said that he comes to give something which nobody else has given before. Anarpit charim chirat karunaya avtirana kalau. He has come to give something, not never, but for a very, very long time. He is, what has not been given, he is giving. So in that sense, it's special. So, let's see how Mahaprabhu's gifts have had a ripple effect in, tra in transforming the course of human history. So yesterday I started by talking about this acronym CAPS, C-A-P-S. So how has Mahaprabhu transformed the course of Indian history? I talked about culturally, I mentioned that before Mahaprabhu, the Vedic tradition had exhibited his resilience even amid the time of the Islamic invasion, by continuing on, but more privately. Bhakti can be practiced in one's homes. Bhakti does not require big temples. If they're there, good. But Bhakti can be transformed, practiced simply by hearing or chanting. And Bhakti does not require elaborate fire sacrifices. So Bhakti had become, we could say, more internalized, if not internalized, at least more privatized, individually done. But it is Mahaprabhu who for the first time uh, started having public Sankirtans. And that became the distinctive contribution of Mahaprabhu. Mahaprabhu is defined often as the dancing de God, the dancing divinity. So he started, the, he, he, the cultural transformation that he brought about was not just simply that the Kirtans which were done indoors started being out, outdoors. That simultaneously indicated an assertiveness of the Vedic cultural identity. And that has spread onwards, onwards. And recently there was a survey done in America about what are people's perceptions of India. And one of the prominent iconic images that Western people have, what is India? He says, India is the place from this, where this 
these dancing people who sing in front of the Ratha Kart have come, the charity, chariot festival. So that has become one of the defining images of India. So this is the cultural transformation. I talked about this elaborately, just sum summarizing it here. And attitudinally, it was the same point I made, that Mahaprabhu, he was not just, okay, just go out and dance, but rather share Krishna's message with everyone. Yara dekho tare kaho Krishna upadesh. Amara agya guru hai tarai desh. The idea that an ordinary person can be a guru and that that person should share the message with everyone. Now that, in the broad Vedic tradition and even in the specific bhakti tradition, that idea has few precedents. Yes, the, the Indian tradition was definitely philosophical and it was also polemical. Polemical in the sense that philosophy was often debated vigorously. But we don't see the active attempt to uh, share one's faith with others too much. I mentioned yesterday, Drupada was a Shaivite and the, uh, and Pand the Pandavas were Vaishnavites. But, but there was no attempt to convert Drupada to Vaishnavism. But what happened was, since the Abrahamic religion started coming to India, then they had that ethos of aggressive proselytization. Convert everyone by force or by trickery or whatever means. So in order to take a thorn out of a thorn, the, the Vaishnava tradition in particular and the broad Vedic tradition has also recognized that when the world is attacking, we can't just be stagnant. So, but there's a significant difference between the Vaishnava understanding of sharing Krishna Bhakti and the Abrahamic understanding of conversion or proselytization. Their idea is that if somebody doesn't come to this path, they are all going to go to hell. But the Vedic understanding is the soul is there in everyone's heart and everyone is on a spiritual journey. So, but we can accelerate that journey. We can assist the super soul in what he's doing in the hearts and lives of everyone. So Mahaprabhu personally traveled far and wide across India and Mahaprabhu entered into the hearts of his followers like Rupa and Sanatana Goswami and others and they continued the legacy. And then Srila Prabhupada did the same much further. So that was in terms of attitude that the bhakti is not just to be relished personally but it is to be actively shared with others. So Sankirtan is not just a celebration of our devotion publicly. It is actually an opportunity or an invitation for everyone to join in. So placing the onus on everyone that Amara Agya Guru hai that I already give the instruction, just become a teacher and share with others. So this is two what I discussed yesterday. Now let's discuss philosophically and socially. What were the changes that Mahaprabhu has brought about? Now, as I mentioned, philosophically, the tradition, the Indic tradition has been among the most philosophical in the world. The Greeks, have been also considered to be highly philosophical. In fact, almost all the intellectual traditions in the West, they, if you trace them backwards, it is said that they all go to the doors of Greece. However, there are quite a few scholars who have now done research to indicate that many of these prominent Greek philosophers got their ideas from Indian philosophers. So, irrespective of that, the point is that India had a lot of has a rich philosophical tradition. And the Gaudiya Vaishnava tradition is also a part, it's a flowering of the rich philosophical tradition that was there in India. Now, if you look at Mahaprabhu's life trajectory, hmm, that indicates what his purpose in studying and sharing philosophy was. That first before that, let's look at how philosophy is understood, generally speaking, in the West and how Mahaprabhu has added, Mahaprabhu and his tradition has added something distinct to the philosophy. So generally what is philosophy? Philosophy literally means philine is love and sophos is truth. So philosophy is essentially love for truth. We try to understand what is reality. The, the Sanskrit word is darshan. Darshan means 
to see reality, to perceive things as they are. So that is philosophy. Now, broadly speaking, in Western terms, philosophy has these four broad categories. And it's not just, the terms may be Western, but the principles are there in the Vedic tradition also. So epistemology is, okay, how do I know things? So that's where we have Pratyaksha Anuman Shabda. Then ontology is, okay, what is out there? What is the nature of reality? Then soteriology is, what is the ultimate destination? Okay, what is the purpose of life? So for example, for Vaishnavas, it is eternal loving union with the Lord. For Advaitins, it is merging with the Lord. And then ethics is, okay, how am I meant to live? So if we take this in terms of a road map, if somebody is on a journey, okay, so if somebody is in a, if somebody is in a car, but all around him there is mist. And when there is complete mist of very thick fog all around them, can they rely on their eyes to see things? Maybe they have some um, app on their phone which is like a map. Maybe they have some uh, map on their car, in their car. So which is, what is the thing that one can rely on? So that is epistemology. If I am in a stranded place and I want to go somewhere, what is the reliable source of knowledge? Can I rely on my eyes? But it's, it's misty everywhere. Can I rely on this map? But there is no internet, so it's not working. So what can I rely on? So epistemology is, what can I rely on for gaining knowledge? That ontology is, okay, if I want to drive a car, what is the nature of the territory? Okay, is it rocky? Is it marshy? Is it slippery? Uh, is it steep up? Is it a straight road? What is the nature of the territory? That's ontology. Then, the soteriology is, okay, where do I want to go? What is the ultimate destination where I'm going to go? And then ethics is, what are the rules for driving the car? Should I be driving on the left? Should I be driving on the right? When should I stop? When should I drive? So, in that sense, these branches of philosophy, if philosophy is the journey toward truth, so these branches broadly guide us toward the truth. And we see this is there in the Vedic tradition also, but what Mahaprabhu added was, Aesthetics. Aesthetics or rasa. The whole tradition of Mahaprabhu is centered on the experience of rasa. So aesthetics means, okay, not just what is the nature of reality, but how is reality being experienced. Now there are many extraordinary pastimes within Mahaprabhu's Leela, which cannot be easily understood unless we consider the aspect of aesthetics, aspect of rasa. So there is that very unusual pastime where one of the senior most associates of Mahaprabhu, Advaita Acharya, suddenly starts speaking Advaita Vada. He starts commenting on Shariraka Bhashya. And now to understand how serious it is in, from those perspectives, Maya Mahaprabhu if there's one thing he was strongly against, it is not just, okay, your philosophy is wrong. But what happened is that the Advaitic philosophy denies the very foundation of devotion. If God and the soul are just one, then whom are we actually going to devote ourselves to? Whom are we going to love? So it's, it's, it's not just wrong, it's, uh, it's destroying the foundation of bhakti. That's why Mahaprabhu was very strongly against it. And then what happened is Ad Advaita Acharya, who is the person who called Mahaprabhu to appear, he performed severe austerities and that's how Mahaprabhu appeared. And he called upon Mahaprabhu to appear so that he would deliver the whole world. It was his, his great devotion that he called and Mahaprabhu reciprocated by descending. And what is that person doing? That person has started speaking this non-dual philosophy. And when Mahaprabhu hears this, he is he's enraged. There are a few times in Chaitanya Lila where Mahaprabhu becomes angry. Which is the most famous example of Mahaprabhu's anger? Yeah, sorry? Jagai and Madai, yes. When Nityanand Prabhu is hit, at that time, Mahaprabhu says, Chakra, Chakra. And he's about to decapitate those who have dared to attack his dear associate Nityanand Prabhu. 
So broad, so that is, we could say, a philosophical attack on one of his associates. But here what has happened is, Mahaprabhu, within the Leela, he thinks that there is an intellectual attack on one of his associates. But it is not just that the, uh, the associate has been attacked, but has been converted. So, it's, it's like, you know, if we have an army, and we have a so general in the army, and the general is meant to lead the fight against the opponents. And suddenly, the, the general is in charge of a big cannon or a big high-tech high -tech gun. So you just shoot and kill thousands of soldiers, hundreds of soldiers on the opposite side. And suddenly, that general turns the gun and starts shooting his own soldiers. Hey, what do you do at such a time? So, there can be few things as catastrophic as that for an army. So what happens is, Advaita Acharya is speaking Advaita Vad, his name is Advaita, but that Advaita refers not to non-dual philosophy. That Advaita refers to the non to the non-difference between the various manifestations of divinity. Advaita Machyutam Anadim Anantarupam. The Lord has many manifestations, but they are all non-different. So, so that Advaita is different. But anyway, Advaita Acharya speaking this kind of philosophy was outrageous for Mahaprabhu. And Mahaprabhu just charged to the race to the abode of Advaita Acharya. And when he heard Advaita Acharya saw Mahaprabhu appearing, you know, sometimes when we say we are doing something which we are not sure if some of our authorities will approve or not. We may do it when they are not present, but as soon as they come in, we'll change tack. Okay, <laughs> we may start speaking something else or doing something else. But here, Advaita Acharya, when he sees Mahaprabhu appearing, he starts speaking Mayavad even more aggressively. And what happens at that time? Mahaprabhu just charges up to him. And he's so enraged. He said, you called upon me to deliver the world by sp spreading bhakti. Why are you not speaking Mayavad? And he goes and is about to almost attack Advaita Acharya. This is all unheard of. Because Adad Acharya, Mahaprabhu would always treat him like a venerable elder. He was of the age of his father. And Mahaprabhu would treat him with due deference. But here he is almost about to attack him. And as soon as Mahaprabhu comes to attack him, what happens is, at that time Adad Acharya, and he folds this, now my purpose is fulfilled. Now, O oh Lord, you have stopped treating me like an elder and you have accepted me as your servitor. And as soon as he speaks this, Mahaprabhu, oh, this is all a trick. <laughs> Mahaprabhu understands that. So why would Adhacharya go through why would Adhacharya go through all this? Because he wants to experience a rasa. He wants to experience the richness of the relationship with the Lord. And what is that richness? He doesn't want the Lord to treat him like a venerable elder. He says, you are the Lord of everyone. You are the master of everyone. So, treat me like a servitor. <coughs> so, this is the experience of rasa. And now, what do we mean by rasa over here? See, in general, in the spiritual path, Many people think that emotions come in the way and emotions prevent us from perceiving reality. And that is true to some extent. As they say that what happens is love is blind. That if so, Now there the word love is used more in the sense of infatuation. That when somebody is infatuated by attraction, just, just forget everything else. So emotions often blind us. And that's why often it is thought that the way to come out of maya is to, is to reduce our emotions and eventually to remove our emotions also. That's the, that's the normal understanding of how to come out of maya. But what Mahaprabhu focuses on, and the understanding of the bhakti tradition, but Mahaprabhu takes it even further is that, that actually the way out of illusion is not by removing emotion, but by redirecting emotion redirecting emotion towards the Lord. Now you may say that is, that is understood very easily. So what is, what is rasa in this? See, rasa is something much more distinct. Yesterday I mentioned about how Ramanucharya, Madhvacharya, each of these acharyas has had a different definition of bhakti. 
based on their approach to the ultimate reality and their approach toward bhakti also. In our tradition, in the Gaudiya tradition, based on the teachings of Mahaprabhu, Rupa Goswami has given a definition. And that definition centers on Anushilanam. Anushilanam means bhakti is something to be cultivated. Anyabilashita shunyam, jnana karma dinavrutam, anukulena krishnanu shilanam bhakti ruttama. So, what is shilanam? Shilanam, as I said, means cultivation. So, different traditions also have different understandings of how bhakti manifests in the heart. Now, all traditions agree that bhakti is ultimately a result of krupa. It's a result of mercy. Only when the Lord is merciful, then that attraction towards Him, that affection towards Him, that emotion in the heart appears. We may, we may chant the holy names every day, but some days we may chant and we may feel such strength, such connection. We feel, I want to chant more and more rounds. And one day we feel like that, and the very next day when we start chanting, we may take our beads out of the bead bag. You know, it's 108 or 1008 round beads over here. This is just not getting over. So what happens is that it is not just our mechanical utterance of the holy names that is giving us that experience of taste or strength. It is the krupa that is coming. It is the mercy of the Lord by which we get the taste. So that mercy is required for getting taste is universal. But what Mahaprabhu taught is that it is not just mercy, it is shilanam. We all can cultivate our life and our heart in such a way that that experience of Krishna, that sweetness of bhakti will become more and more accessible. And the metaphor that Mahaprabhu gives is that of a gardener. We know that example. Shravana sinchana, shravana kirtana, karaya sinchana. The bhakti lata beach is given and that beach is to be watered. And we water it by hearing and chanting. So now if we consider, let's, let's look at the contrast between some of either the pastimes or the teachings of Mahaprabhu over here. So at one level, we know Mahaprabhu himself was at the highest level of devotion. He was experiencing the topmost love of Vrindavan, Radharani's love for Krishna. At the same time, what did Mahaprabhu do when he was talking with Sarovam Bhattacharya? He just sat and he heard and he continued hearing and he continued hearing. So what was he doing over there? If you see that whole pastime, it's, it is actually the the transformation of Sarvam Bhattacharya from Advaita into a Bhakta. But how does he do that? Yes, there is philosophical discussion, but there is something that happens before that. And that is especially significant for how his heart gets transformed. And that's where Rasa comes in. See, right from the beginning, when Sarvam Bhattacharya sees Prakashan Mahaprabhu, he's attracted to him. And at least to some extent, his attraction is paternal. He feels that, oh, this is like my son. And Mahaprabhu appreciates that. Even if it is a son, now somebody may say, oh, you think God is your son? Or a grahastha thing that, uh, so you think yeah, you're a grahastha and he's a sannyasi and you still you think that. So when you talk about son, it's not so much in terms of I will order you and I will, you have to obey me. It is more in terms of I have a duty to protect. That's why he has Mahaprabhu. When Mahaprabhu faints, he doesn't even know him. Even at that time, Jagannath temple was a big temple. And lots of people from all over the uh, country would come to be at Jagannath's temple. And this was a time when Sahajiyaism was rising. Now, Sahajiyaism is what? That you just take devotion very cheaply. And imitate. Imitate as if one has got advanced devotional emotions. When one has not got them. Gaur Krishnadas Babaji was quite cutting in his expose of Sahajiyaism. He said that, that suppose a woman is pregnant and she's in the final stage of pregnancy. At that time, there are contractions and there are labor pains. And at that time, the woman may even scream. 
But through that scream, what is going to happen is a child, new life, a child is going to be born. A new life is going to come. And when that pregnant woman screams, what happens is everybody comes and takes care of her. The doctor comes and everybody attends to her. But suppose a woman is not pregnant and she just starts screaming. Well, nothing is going to happen by that screaming. No child is going to be appear, appear by that. Isn't it? So he says this is the difference between the ecstasy of truly advanced devotees and the act of the Sahajiyas. So the act of the Sahaj the Sahajiyas, they may, they may act as if they've got tears in their eyes, they may dance, they seem to dance in ecstasy, but there is no love in their heart. There is no love in their heart, they are doing it for show. And that's why there is no, not much transformation. So the point I'm making over here is that there were Sahajiyas and at that time and Mahaprabhu had come towards the darshan of Lord Jagannath and suddenly had fainted. This was a typical behavior of Sahajiyas. But Sarobham saw, actually even, in, even when he was unconscious, Mahaprabhu seemed to be exist, ex exhibiting very exalted symptoms of love of God. And he could have taken him out and maybe put him outside. He could have taken him into some, um, some of the rooms nearby. But he had him taken right to his own home. That was his service attitude. And then he arranged, after Mahaprabhu came back to consciousness, he arranged four different things. He says, he first arranged for him to stay. He arranged his staying place. He arranged his prasad. And he said, in future, don't go to take darshan of Jagannath alone. Go with someone. So he said, I'll arrange for a person to be there with you. You go with someone. So why was that? See, all this is his service attitude. And the fourth was, he says, you're just young sannyasi. You know, how will you be protected from the illusions of the world? You need to hear Vedanta. And when he is saying, you know, I'll speak Vedanta to you, that is not so much he's putting himself in a superior position. And you are ignorant and I will enlighten you. That is not his mood. It is actually his service attitude. And that's why as I said, he, if you see the picture, he has Mahaprabhu seated on a higher seat and he's sitting below. And then he speaks Vedanta. His idea is he wants to serve and protect Mahaprabhu. And what does Mahaprabhu do? Throughout Mahaprabhu accepts his service. He focuses on his service attitude. Gopinath Acharya is a little annoyed initially. Some of the other associates of Mahaprabhu are also annoyed. They are saying that What's happening over here? Don't you know he's the Supreme Lord? And he doesn't need protection from, from temptation. He doesn't, he, uh, sorry, this is the third thing he says is, I can offer him, I can arrange for him to be initiated in a more elevated sampradaya. So he arranges for his prasad and his uh, stay. He, uh, he arranges for him to have a, to not go alone to the exertion of Jagannath. He says, I can arrange for him to be initiated in a higher sampradaya. And he says, I'll speak Vedanta to you. So his devotees are, Mahaprabhu's associates are annoyed by all this. But what is Mahaprabhu doing? Mahaprabhu is actually cultivating the heart of Sarvabhama. He is serving and Mahaprabhu is accepting that service. So it's Sevon Mukhe Hi Jivadav Svayameva Spuratyadaha. It is the service by which Spuratyadaha in the heart devotion starts manifesting. Now, so in, whenever Mahaprabhu does things, sometimes he does things in great extreme. So what is one of the things he does is, just so, because at that time, Advaitavada was very respected. Mm -hmm. Now how respected was Mayavada at that time? Just to get a glimpse of that, we see almost all the Acharya, Ramacharya's Guru, Yadha Prakash, was Advaitavadi. Almost all the prominent intellectuals at that time, where Advaita Vadis? And say, if today somebody comes up with some idea and they say, this is unscientific. If somebody comes up with a medicine, say some non uh, alternative medicine comes up, say Ayurveda or some naturopathy, they come up with some medicine. But if mainstream science says this is unscientific, immediately most people will reject it. So why? Because science has such a strong hold on people's minds today. So stronger than the hold that science has on people's minds today was the hold that Advaitavad had on people's mind at that time. So Mahaprabhu took sannyas in Advaitic Sampradaya just so that the, his message would have respectability. And then what does Mahaprabhu do? 
that same Mahaprabhu who has said Mayavad Bhashya Shunile Haile Sarvanash, anyone who speaks Mayavad, will be, anyone who hears Mayavad will be destroyed. He hears Sarvam Bhattacharya speak that for seven days. So what is going on over here? So the point is that Mahaprabhu is actually letting service soften the heart. So we have to look not just at the content of an action, we also look at the intent of the action. So what is the content? And in terms of content, he is speaking Mayavad. But in terms of intent, he is actually serving Mahaprabhu. And Mahaprabhu is not focused on the content, he is focusing on the intent. And then what happens at the end of the seventh day? What happens? Does anyone remember? In that past time? Towards the end of the seventh day? Yes? Yeah. Yes, do you have any questions? What is going on? See, normally, what happens is, despite our best efforts, when we are hearing for some, from, from someone, as Prabhupada says, the face is the mirror of the mind. So if we understand, we agree. If we, if we, if, if we understand, we appreciate, then we nod. Uh, if we are not interested, we nod off. <laughs> sometimes we nod, sometimes we nod off. Or if we just can't relate with anything. You know, it's like sometimes uh, the audience face is like somebody watching a foreign language movie. <laughs> no, no, what is going on over here? <laughs> So, our face is very responsive, generally speaking. Uh, it's actually, if there is no reaction from the audience, it's, it's a little discomfort, discomforting. You know, there's one place uh, when I travel abroad, I go, there's one devotee over there, just comes and sits right in the front. And then, without nodding his head, without shaking, he just sits and stares. Not even stares, glares. <laughs> <laughs> just glares at the... First time when I saw that, I was a little uncomfortable. What is going on? Am I doing something wrong? And then, uh, eventually, I realized that the only way I can speak is not look at him. <laughs> look at everyone else. Then I asked uh, the organizer, they said, no, that is how he is. You know, he does that with everyone. So, so, anyway, so what happens is, the audience reaction determines how well a person is able to speak. Hmm. Mahaprabhu says that he gives a certain, he gives a what? Uh, Eight, nine, ten meanings to of the Atmaram verse. How many exactly? Sixteen first. No, no, first. To Sarvam Bhattacharya, he gives a finite, uh, about, uh, about ten meanings or so of the Atmaram verse. But when, because Sarum, there's a little bit of, a, uh, there's a still, he's trying to bring him to the path of bhakti. But with Sanadana Goswami, he gives sixty-four meanings. He, the ecstasy increases more and more. So, what is Mahaprabhu doing over here? Through it all, Sarvabhama is doing this seva. He wants to serve. And Mahaprabhu is, he, whatever, he is not responding. He's not appreciating the content of the message, but still accepting the service. So, Sarvabhama is unable to read him. What is going on over here? He says, do you understand or do you not understand? And then Mahaprabhu starts speaking. So what has happened over here is, the transformation of the heart doesn't happen just through philosophy. That is important, and there's no, no downplaying the importance of philosophy. But ultimately, it is we need to experience things. Rasa is important. And what Mahaprabhu does is he expertly enables everyone to experience rasa. So even when he's with Prakashan Saraswati, he sits at a lower place. And then they say, Oh, why are you sitting at a lower place? Please come and sit with us. They come close to him, they pick, they hold him up, the Advaitins, and they bring him up. They do seva for him. So, bhakti becomes, the wisdom of bhakti becomes accessible, it becomes relishable, it becomes intelligible through rasa. And what did Mahaprabhu say? He brought rasa as the, it's a center part of spirituality. It's not philosophy, it is rasa. So, now what, does, what is so special about Mahaprabhu talking about rasa? You know, that rasa is a big part of the Indian tradition. Bharat Muni talks about it in the Natya Shastra. Natya Shastra is a whole big treatise on how dramas are to be performed. Now, what the costume should be, how the dialogue should be, how the sets should be. And in Natya Shastra, the whole idea is that 
if the drama is performed properly then the audience will experience appropriate emotion hmm? and say that is the rasa say sometimes if some characters are acting in a very ludicrous way so what happens is it's 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 supposed to be a tragic scene where one person lops off the head of the other person but everybody is acting in such a strange way that that when the head is lopped off the audience starts laughing you know that is ras abhas that is not the rasa we want over here when somebody is killed that is not a comic scene that is not a scene for laughter that should be angst anguish horror pain terror so the idea is that the drama has to be performed in such a way that the audience experiences the appropriate emotion and that appropriate emotion that is experienced is called rasa so the term rasa is very widely there in the vedic tradition but that is the appropriate ex emotion experienced when a drama is performed properly now of course in general in you could say indian vernacular languages the word rasa is common but that is like we have aam ras and ganna ras and something like that you know we have that is just rasa is often used as equivalent for juice but uh, rasa in the technical uh, sanskrit sense is more of a emotion that is a result of a particular set of actions being depicted on the stage so now what is rasa there is an important thing over here rasa can be experienced by a rasik not everybody can experience rasa so what does this mean this, this actually this concept mahaprabhu has not introduced this mahaprabhu has systematized it what do you mean by systematized it that actually different people will experience different things say for example if sa if say a female dancer is doing bharatnatyam now a person who is in complete rajas or tamas they will only see that this person is female and they will feel some sensual desires to it somebody who has a little more artistic sense they say oh this dance has been done so gracefully they'll appreciate it. but somebody who say knows krishna leela and then they say that okay this gesture means this this gesture means this gesture means this so they will appreciate not just the dance but what is being depicted through the dance they'll remember krishna and they'll remember they'll appreciate how beautifully krishna leela is being depicted so the same thing is happening but the emotion is very different one it could be a sensual desire the other could be artistic appreciation and the other third is devotional remembrance so see, that means see if, when we talk about philosophy as the love for truth or the search for truth see we don't just need to know the truth we need to experience the right emotion in relationship with the truth if somebody comes to a bharatnatyam and they, all that they experience is sensual desire they may have come to a very elevated art form but they have not experienced that art form so just seeing bharatnatyam is not enough seeing bharatnatyam and experiencing the emotion that that dance is meant to evoke that is important so that's why the spiritual journey going back to the starting metaphor that somebody is lost in a car in the mist it's not just you get to a particular place but you get to the particular place with the right emotion so similarly actually this idea of aesthetics that different people will experience different things this is very much there in the vedic tradition the brihadaranyaka upanishad describes how the devas the danavas and the manavas all three ones go to brahma and they all say please enlighten us please give us wisdom by which we all can grow and brahma ji just speaks one syllable the and he departs just please like, receives the and he departs so what happens is it is described that devtas the manavas and the danavas they all understand that the differently so so the devatas understand that so they they, they are all basically asking how can we grow spiritually how can we uh, what what is it that we should do so that we can grow on the spiritual path so devatas understand that the means dham that we live in the heavens where there is somras there are apsaras and we can get caught in sensual pleasures so if you want to grow spiritually 
That da means we should do dhamma. Dhamma is sense control. We should control our senses. So, so the manavas they understand that da means dana. That we should become more charitable. That we live in a human community and we should care more for each other. We should care more for each other. And we, if we are selfish, we will not go spiritually. Krishna says that if you want to become atmavan, then karma falatyaga. One has to sacrifice the fruits of one's work. And the danavas, they understand the means daya. See, danavas are very powerful. But with power can come corruptness. They can become cruel. So he says that don't be cruel. Be kind. Daya. So the same syllable, the, means three different things. And when all three of them say this, this is what we have understood. Brahmaji appears again and says, yes. And he departs. So the idea is, just one syllable can mean different things for different people. So the Bhagavatam also says that, when Brahmaji read the Bhagavatam for the first time, first he thought his conclusion, for, not the Bhagavatam, the Vedas for the first time, he thought their conclusion is karma. Then he thought their conclusion is jnana. Then he thought their conclusion is, then he realized the conclusion is bhakti. So, the idea is Mahaprabhu's purpose is to ensure that people, different people will pursue the same one to the differently. In the Bhagavatam, in the 10th canto, it is described that when Krishna comes in the wrestling arena, there are different people who see, perceive him differently. Kamsa and his associates see him, oh, this is death personified who has come for us. But that's not a very good perception. It's good at least they are going to stop their sinful activities. But that's not the perception that is going to elevate them spiritually to the ultimate destination. So what Mahaprabhu does is, Mahaprabhu said, Rasa is not just something which you see a drama and then you experience Rasa over there. He says, it is something which we can experience when we are connected with Krishna. And it is not something which we have to experience occasionally. When some, Even in a drama, what happens is, it's not that every part of a drama is exciting. In a movie, it's not that every scene is exciting. Of course, if a movie is good or a drama is good, every moment engages a person. Was once a famous editor was asked, you know, the author has already written the book. What is your job? What do you, why are you paid for? So the editor said famously that I am I I edit out the books. I edit out the pages that the reader will skip. <laughs> I edit out the pages that the reader will skip. So similarly in a movie editor, the editor is supposed to do what? Okay, these scenes are not very interesting, just skip them. So the idea is that rasa needs to be evoked constantly. If, an, if, if say, any, uh, if something is not continuously interesting, continuously stimulating, so what happens is the mind is like a, like a, like a restless bird, it's seated on a branch, and the smallest sort of distraction is like a clap. The bird of the mind flies away immediately. So like that we can get distracted. So rasa, what, Mah what Mahaprabhu says is, it's not just when you say in a very dramatic scene in a drama, we feel rasa. Rasa is something to be experienced perennially, constantly. So the idea is, a bhakta yomam pashyati sarvata sarvam chami pashyati. So sthavara jangam na dekhi na dekhi tara murti. Sarvatra hai nija ishta devas purti. So, that a devotee is meant to experience Krishna everywhere and relish that experience of Krishna. So, this centrality, not just knowing the ultimate reality, but experiencing the ultimate reality in a devotional way. That is what Mahaprabhu emphasized. And that is what Bhakti Samad Sindhu is all about. Okay, you know, we take Charanamrut, we take Darshan of the Lord. All these are ways in which you can experience Rasa. So, this aesthetic aspect of divinity in, in fact, in one sense, in the bhakti tradition, the aesthetic aspect is more important than even the analytical aspect. The aesthetic aspect, experiencing Krishna is actually more important even than perceiving reality accurately. What do I mean by that? Isn't perceiving reality accurately important? Yes, it is. But there's something much more over there. We know when Mahaprabhu was going towards Jagannath, uh, toward, from Jagannath Puri towards Vrindavan, so it is described that whenever he would see a hill, what would he think it to be? Govardhan, thank you. Whenever he would see a river, what would he think it to be? Yamuna. Whenever he would see any forest, he would think it to be? Vrindavan. Now, 
this is a question. So whenever he would see any hill, he thought it to be Govardhan. Now was that hill Govardhan? No? How many of you think no? When Mahaprabhu saw any hill, uh, was it Govardhan or was it not Govardhan? Well, now when I ask this question, you are hesitating to say no, is it? <laughs> because if we say no, that means is Mahaprabhu wrong? <laughs> so what is going on over here? How could we say that Mahaprabhu is wrong? But the point is, over here, there is this Achinta Bhedavi that comes in. Mahaprabhu saw that hill as hell as Govardhan, that forest as Vrindavan, that river as Yamuna. But the fact is, he did not stop there. He kept moving toward Govardhan, Vrindavan, Mathura. Uh, Govardhan, Vrindavan, Yamuna, isn't it? So there is Achinta Veda Ved. So when he says that he saw it, the point over here is not the accuracy of his perception. The point here is the absorption of his consciousness. There are two different things. See, there is the accuracy of the perception from the point of, we say, God can't commit any mistakes. How can he, mis how can he mistake one thing to be another? No, this, this mistake is not, is not maya. You could, if it already is maya, it is yoga maya. So maya is that which is not. Maya, that which is not. Mm. There is, uh, I was in America, I was once giving a class. I, the devotees organized a program for me. So I asked, what is the, what is the university is speaking? So he says, it's called the American Institute of Illusion. So it's called an Institute of Illusion. The idea of illusion is that it is basically for making movies and making, uh, making dramas and things like that. So the point is that actually, illusion is not easy to create. <laughs> illusion is not easy to create. See, there are, uh, whether it's Bollywood or Hollywood, they make so many movies and most of the movies bomb. They flop. Why? Because that illusion is not good enough. <laughs> that illusion is not good enough. It is, when do people want to watch a movie, spend money and spend time to watch a movie? When that illusion captivates them. So, creating illusion is also not easy. So, creating illusion is also not easy. So, the point is that there is Mahamaya and there is Yoga Maya. So, both of these are energies of the Lord. Mama Maya, Duratya, Krishna says. And that's why we don't want to go into illusion. But at the same time, we appreciate the power of the illusory energy. The illusion that he creates is captivating. And when Mahaprabhu is perceiving, when Mahaprabhu is perceiving, hey, this is this is Vrindavan, that actually indicates that he is in Yoga Maya. And of course, Yoga Maya is his energy. That means Yoga Maya's capacity to create that perception is actually Mahaprabhu's capacity only, manifested through him. So it indicates the absorption of his consciousness. And that is glorious. Because he is remembering Krishna everywhere, he is seeing Krishna everywhere. Even where Krishna is not there, even what is not Vrindavan, he is seeing as Vrindavan. So this is actually rasa. So rasa, so there is tattva. Tattva means see what is right and what is wrong. Even if you forget everything from this class, if you just understand this one point of difference between tattva and rasa. Or, uh, tattva is to perceive what is right and to perceive what is wrong. Rasa is to have the right experience, to have the right emotions and the right experience no matter what we are perceiving. No matter what we are perceiving. So, just generally this philosophical journey involves understanding Tattva. And this, is, this is reality, this is illusion. And that is important. But somebody may come to reality, but they may experience no rasa. Somebody, like they, we have this incident of Raghunath Bhatta Goswami coming with, who was that associate? Ram Das, Ram, Ram das Vipra? No, Ram Das Vipra was in South India, no? Or oh, there's two Ram Das Vipras? Ram? Ram Das Vipra only, okay. Ram Das Vipra. So he comes and he's constantly chanting the names of Ram. But in Mahaprabhu senses, and he's chanting the names of Ram, but what is he doing? He's desiring for merging with Ram. And that he doesn't appreciate at all. So he neglects him. 
So one may be doing the right thing, one may be approaching the right reality, but the rasa is very different. One is not experiencing the right rasa. On the other hand, somebody might be actually not at all approaching the right reality. See, Maha, we see Haridas Thakur, he was, he was tempted by a prostitute. That prostitute came and sat next to him. Uh, but Mahaprabhu, sorry, Haridas Thakur, he, normally a person shouldn't be associating with, uh, with, with such situations, such people. But Haridas Thakur, he didn't see that prostitute as a source of enjoyment for himself. He saw her as a soul, a soul who could be delivered by the power of the Holy Name. And he continued chanting. So what is happening over here is, see, the rasa is different. Why? What is he perceiving is not as important as how he is perceiving. That's why Nityanand, about Nityanand Prabhu, Vrindavan Das Chakur says that even if he goes to a bar or a brothel, I'll know he's going there for delivering people. So normally, a person should not go to such places. But if he goes there, his level of consciousness is different. The rasa that he's experiencing is very different. So the rasa that he's experiencing is, is quite profound. So tattva is important, but more important than tattva is rasa. More important than tattva is rasa. So many of the... So this Mahaprabhu brought this rasa aspect very prominently. That... Yes, truth has to be analyzed. Ultimate reality has to be analyzed. But finally, ultimate reality is to be relished. And what is the process for relishing this? That is what he taught Rupa Goswami. And the whole Bhakti Rasamrat Sindhu is like a manual for devotion. How we all can experience rasa. That aesthetic element of bhakti is something which Mahaprabhu, for the first time, he, he brought the bhakti tradition and the rasa tradition together in this very beautiful synthesis. So, <clears throat> I was uh, once talking with His Honest Radhanath Maharaj. No, I was talking with him how, how sometimes we have a very stereotype understanding of uh, who Prabhupada was and what Prabhupada did. So, he, Maharaj was telling me that many of the life members who helped Prabhupada build the Juhu temple, they were all Advaitic, uh, they were all followers of Mayavad. They were not only followers, they were actually initiated by prominent Mayavadi gurus. But Maharaj said, I went to their houses on many occasions and they had big, big pictures of these Mayavadi gurus in their homes. And they had them, and Prabhupada also visited them. But Prabhupada engaged them in service and they did a lot of service. So he said, one of, one of such life members, when he was in the last days, Maharaj said, I went to meet him. And he said, he was, he was so weak and so sick. But when I saw him, he immediately started glorifying Prabhupada. He says, Prabhupada was such a saintly person. What he achieved is unparalleled in the history. And with whatever little bodily energy he had, that he was glorifying Prabhupada so much. So Maharaj is telling me that, I was thinking at that time, you know, when he is going to depart from the world, is, is Krishna going to see, that, oh, he was initiated in the Mayavad Sampradaya? Or is Krishna going to see this person has such a great appreciation for Prabhupada? Had such a great devotion for Prabhupada? So he says, irrespective of how he might have been, where he might have been initiated, the fact that he had such devotion for Prabhupada would surely ensure that Krishna's mercy comes upon him. So he, this is a significant, significant example of the difference between Tattva and Rasa. So, in terms of tattva, a person might be initiated in a particular, a particular, uh, particular Mayavadi group or whatever. But, if a person has the devotional disposition towards a great saintly person, to a great devotee, that is, that may ma that is what will matter for Krishna much, much more. So, our purpose is definitely is to evoke, is to analyze, we definitely want to t speak philosophy and help people understand tattva. But more important than tattva is to actually evoke rasa. To actually evoke emotion for attracting people towards Krishna. And Prabhupada spoke philosophy, but what attracted people to Prabhupada and to Krishna was that he was able to evoke that emotion when Malti Mataji and Prabhu and Shamsundar Prabhu, because of some things which they had got implicated into in the pre-devotional lives, you know, they had to be, for a short while, sent to be a jail. 
నా ప్రభుపాద్ కూడా ఐ సైడ్ యూనో ఓ ఐ థాట్ యు ఆర్ సిన్సియర్ డివోటీస్ అండ్ నౌ యు ఆర్ మై లీడింగ్ డిసైపుల్స్ అండ్ నవ్ యూ టు జైల్ వాట్ గోన్ టు హ్యాపన్ టు మై మూమెంట్ వాట్ పీపుల్ థింక్ అబౌట్ మీ అండ్ మై మూమెంట్ ప్రభుపాద్ కూడా సెట్ దట్ ప్రభుపాద్ సైడ్ కృష్ణ వాజ్ ఆల్సో బాన్ ఇన్ ద జైల్ జస్ట్ గో దేర్ అండ్ కమ్ బ్యాక్ సో సో వాట్ హ్యాపెడ్ వాజ్ ప్రభుపాద్ యూ వోక్ ది దెన్ వి వై సెట్ దిస్ ఇస్ జస్ట్ ఇట్స్ ఎ స్వీట్ స్వీట్నెస్ ఆఫ్ ప్రభుపాద్ ఇట్స్ నాట్ జస్ట్ స్వీట్నెస్ ఇట్ ఇస్ స్వీట్నెస్ but it is more even in that situation prabhupad is reminding them of krishna and prabhupad is helping them evoke for positive emotion in the relationship with krishna that is critical so it is when that is done that rasa is experience that is what will attract a person towards krishna so you can actually analyze various past times of mahaprabhu in each past time he is actually invoking rasa in the hearts of his devotees and sanatan goswami has this plan to commit suicide he feels my body is diseased and there are this all these sores on my body through which passes coming and mahaprabhu comes and embraces me mahaprabhu's body becomes dirty by this uh, you know i don't want this but i tell no mahaprabhu doesn't listen to it so therefore i'll just end my life and what does mahaprabhu say mahaprabhu doesn't go into tatva don't you know if somebody commits suicide what is going to happen you'll become a ghost no mahaprabhu doesn't go into that what does mahaprabhu say mahaprabhu says that your body is my property what right do you have to destroy my body this is the body that is my property now what is going on over here actually in one sense is when says your body is my property normally speaking somebody would say that what do you think you are i am a slave and you are my master and my body is my property my body is your property no that's not the mood over here what mahaprabhu is saying by this is that actually i accept you and your surrender and you in whatever condition you are i accept you so he says your body is my property means yes that you have surrendered to me and i accept your surrender and that's why what he that expression wins sanatan goswami's heart so in that situation mahaprabhu does not give a philosophical lecture what is this he just evokes his acceptance and then he says i have great plans for you the do the body that you have surrendered to me i want to do great things and you are going to destroy this body so again what mahaprabhu is saying is mahaprabhu is filling with hope oh, oh you have plans for me he is filling with hope again it's all a matter of rasa over there so you know suppose we are facing some big problem and then we don't know how to deal with it and we go to some senior devotee some guide and this is you know and they say we will deal with this now just if they just that say we will deal with this or oh, not you deal with this just that saying of we what happens is it creates a sense of bond a sense of sense of acceptance oh. so that can actually touch the heart a lot more so there are overt declarations of love generally what happens in the western tradition in the western world there is often this public display of affection and that is not there so much in the indian tradition but overt declarations of love can just be for show but there is implicit ex- implicit expressions of love somebody is facing a problem we will face it together the, the person doesn't say i love you i care for you i will protect you just we will face it together just that usage of we is enough to convey love we are in this together so what happens is so mahaprabhu is not saying to sanatan goswami i love you and don't don't end your life he says your body is my property so that creates such a sense of effect acceptance and affirmation in sanatan goswami that his heart is won by that and he completely gives up the idea of ending his life so mahaprabhu not only taught but demonstrated how to evoke rasa and that brings us to the last part that i was talking about the acronym caps c a p s so so philosophically mahaprabhu that the philosophy is not just about understanding reality but experiencing the right emotions in relationship with reality and socially mahaprabhu was very very dramatic and drastic in his acceptance of everyone he he didn't just accepted people from lower caste but he made them into leaders now if you see the caste system has been the bane of indian society indian history and uh, <clears throat> currently 
in india there is the whole of india is you could say in uproar because of the movie kashmir files which talks about how, the kind of religious intolerance and violence that has been done against hindus so there are some leftists who have been trying to cover up this for a long time and they failed to cover up now their counter propaganda is that actually among all the religions in the world just today morning this video was sent to me by five different people that same video says this is this, there are three different leftist scholars interestingly all of them females so what they're saying is among all the religions in the world hinduism is the most violent religion and what is their reasoning no religion has discriminated against members of its own people the way hinduism has the caste system has been there and the caste system is the most dangerous form of violence because it is covert violence overt violence you kill people covert violence you kill the spirits of people you kill the morale of people you kill the opportunities of people and this is the greatest violence therefore hinduism is the most violent most violent religion in the world now this is their attempt to propaganda and yes nobody is denying that the caste system has been discriminatory and in many cases horribly discriminatory however the fact is the caste system the way it is existing and where it is functioning it has less to do with religion and it has more to do with socio cultural conceptions and that is why even when somebody converts to islam or christianity the caste hierarchy still stays among people that you know even among muslim there are lower caste and higher caste so it's more to do with more to do with less to do with religion or scripture because if you look at scripture it's very clear it's based on birth it's it's not based on birth it's based on varna varna is based on guna karma vibhagasha that's the first point second point is okay yes it has been discriminatory but if it has been so discriminatory why didn't everyone from the lower caste just leave and go to other castes many people did but many many people are still in this state there because yes there was hierarchy see hierarchy doesn't always mean discrimination this is a big big misconception in today's world that there can be hierarchy that means a person is higher and a person is lower but not all hierarchy is discriminatory say if somebody is going by a plane and if we say everybody should be equal so what is every passenger says i should be the pilot well that would be disaster no the pilot is the pilot and the pilot will give the command now we are going to a turbulent phase everybody go and sit he says who are you why should i obey you i am paying here no there is a hierarchy and if the if the pilot says oh, go and do, don't stand don't walk anywhere don't go to the lobby go and sit tighten your seat belts everybody has to obey that's a hierarchy but does that mean there's discrimination no everybody is cooperating so that the plane will get to a destination so the big mistake is to think that every hierarchy is discriminatory that no hierarchy is sometimes a necessary for functioning in society and yes there were people from what we call as lower caste but they were happy in their position i'm not saying that they were not exploited but if they had been so exploited they could have all left why didn't they leave because there was a sense of community there was a sense of belonging yes there is certainly some disparity but disparity and injustice are just a part of human existence if we can consider that way when the when christians they started uh, colonizing the world so uh, the catholics they went to south america the protestants they went to north america and what happened they had that conception they may not call it the caste system but it very much uh, arose from their relig- a complex combination of their religious and cultural conceptions they thought we are civilized people and what did they do with the natives the native americans in america are almost annihilated the aztec the mayan the uh, the inca civilization south america are almost annihilated but india the lower caste is still existing so if it had been as violent why did the lower caste not live if the it had been so violent how were the lower caste still surviving so the point is this is all discrim- this is all mis this is all uh ideology driven propaganda and the fact is yes there was discrimination now how am i connecting this with mahaprabhu 
The point is, yes, within the Vedic system itself, when something went wrong, how to set it right, that mechanism or that idea, that initiative also came from within the Vedic system itself. And when the caste system became very discriminatory, it was the bhakti tradition that corrected that discrimination. So we don't need leftist intellectuals or leftist scholars to tell us this is terrible. You know, there have been, there have been saints within the tradition itself who have recognized this is bad and they have corrected it. So right from Ramanujacharya onwards, great saintly people have recognized the dangers of the caste system when it became discriminatory and they tried to correct it. Recently in Hyderabad, uh, the statue of equality was installed because Ramacharya was a pioneer in bringing about equality, in taking society beyond the discrimination of the caste to provide equal spiritual opportunity for everyone. So <clears throat> now again, you know, what these leftist scholars say is that, okay, if he was such a big icon of equality, why is the caste system still there? Why did the caste system not get eliminated? No, the point is not the elimination of the caste system. The point is providing a pathway so the bhakti tradition didn't eradicate the caste system, it provided a social system. Because, because what happened is the bhakti tradition didn't focus on changing social structures. Social structures require political, changing social structures require political power. Like I said, the caste system is not just, a, the discrimination was there, but it's not just a religious system. It's a socio-economic system. And changing that is not easy. Okay, we have this community doing this work, this community doing this work, this work. If we just change that, what is going to come in its place? That requires a lot of thought. What the bhakti tradition did was something different. It provided a pathway for both social and spiritual elevation for those discriminated against by the caste system. I'll just quick, three quick examples and then I'll conclude. So first thing is Mahaprabhu accepted Haridas Thakur. And not just accepted Haridas Thakur. Now lower caste, he was considered outcast. So conventionally speaking, even the lower caste people consider the outcast to be lower. So, what happened was, Mahaprabhu not only accepted Haridas Thakur, he embraced Haridas Thakur, he elevated Haridas Thakur to the, to the level of a Namacharya. Now, Mahaprabhu's primary gift was to give Nam and to take, call someone as the Acharya of the Nam. That means there is practically no position higher that Mahaprabhu can give to anyone else. And Mahaprabhu gave that position to him. And it was not Mahaprabhu alone doing that. This Advaita Acharya, when he was performing the Shraddha of his father, he had Maha, uh, Dharidas Thakur take the first meal. So, it was that the Bhakti tradition has always been very inclusive. And not only that, what Mahaprabhu did was, see, it's, people talk about lower caste and higher caste, but the idea of hierarchy was such that even people who belong to a higher caste, they might get rejected. So who was this person who was rejected, was a Brahmana but was rejected? Subuddhi Rai. Subuddhi Rai, he, some water was sprinkled on him by the Muslim king and because of that he was considered to be outcast. Now there is no scriptural tradition like this, that scriptural teaching that is somebody sprinkles water and you lose your caste. But what happens is, in every tradition, sakale neha mahata, by the power of time, things get contaminated. So there is an emphasis on purity. If you want to worship the deities, we have to be pure. If you want to do yajna, we need to be pure. But purity, rather, rather than being understood to be a function of the heart primarily, and then a function of the body for performing particular rituals, it started becoming like a social, social parameter for discriminating against people. So when that happened, what did Mah Mahaprabhu just neglected the whole thing, just bypassed the whole social system and he accepted Subhudira and he told him that you go and you go to Rindavan and associate with my, uh, associate with the Goswamis and others over there. So Mahaprabhu fully accepted him. This is radical. Many people, we often talk about say conversion happening by force or by trickery. But some ways the people left because they were rejected from the traditional system by people who were narrow-minded. So Mahaprabhu accepted them. So Subhudurai is a representative 
of how people who are unfortunately circumstantially rejected by the Brahminical orthodoxy, they were accepted and they were embraced by Mahaprabhu. And the third is that it is not just that there was a hierarchy with lower caste being discriminated against. That even among Brahmanas there came a hierarchy. See, once a hierarchical mentality comes up, that will go everywhere. So even among Brahmanas there was a hierarchy. And the Sanodhya Brahman was considered to be like a, you could say, a lower caste, upper caste. <laughs> so that means he's a Brahmana, but he's a lower level Brahmana. And at that time, people thought that, oh, you know, we will, will not take food at his place. That's what the Brahmanas thought. But Mahaprabhu took food at his place. So Mahaprabhu was Bhavagrahi, look at the heart. And what happened thereafter is, not only, see, Mahaprabhu did some things. Mahaprabhu was more of a reformer than a revolutionary. See, what is the difference between a reformer and a revolutionary? A reformer means, you know, if a road is bad, okay, you know, there's a pothole over here, let's fix this road over here, just put, fill this pothole. Oh, this bump has gone, got messed up, let's fix this bump properly. So, reformers means make, they, they make incremental changes. Revolutionary means, just blow up this road and create a new road somewhere else. So, revolutionary is like that. So, Mahaprabhu was more of a reformer. Hmm. But, what Mahaprabhu started as a reform, his inspiration was so great that it soon became a revolution. Just two generations down from Mahaprabhu, Narottam Das Thakur was a non-Brahmana, but he was initiating Brahmanas. Now, this was unheard of in the Vedic tradition. Even in other bhakti, tradi other bhakti traditions, this is not something that happens so commonly. But it happened. And if you go, come further generations down the line, Many of the prominent Acharyas in the Bhakti tradition, if you look at our own Acharyas within, within the Gaudiya tradition, recent Acharyas, none of them were Brahmanas. But what happened was, they were accepted as Acharyas and when Brahmanas came and became disciples. So this is the drastic change that Mahaprabhu inaugurated. Now you can say the entire Bhakti tradition did this, but there's a difference between accepting people from lower castes and another is, accepting people as such people as not just potential members of the bhakti community but leaders of the bhakti community and this is what Prabhupada took forward when Prabhupada went to the west Prabhupada was the one person who had conviction in Mahaprabhu's prophecy that when Mahaprabhu has said that throughout the world bhakti will spread the holy name will be chanted he had complete conviction in that and when he went to the west he saw, he saw Krishna, the potential for Krishna Bhakti in everyone. You know, for Prabhupada, it was actually a great sacrifice. Uh, <clears throat> Prabhupada did not write his journals much, like a diary or a journal. I do some courses on journaling. So I've been reading everything that Prabhupada wrote about journaling and on what the journal that Prabhupada read. So I had read this before in Ilamrat, but when I read it, actually when reading, going through Prabhupada's diary, See, Prabhupada, in 1965, when he went to America, he was in Janmashtami and his birthday. Both happened on when he was on Jalduta in the ship. And he cooked food and he offered it to others. He cooked prasad and he, Boga offered it to Krishna and offered it to the whole crew. At least they were Indians. And they understood what Janmashtami was. So Prabhupada celebrated with them. But then the next year, Gaur Purnima. It's just, when I read that, I just felt it's like heartbreaking. Prabhupada's, Prabhupada was in a place, it is Gaur Purnima, and nobody knows about Lord Chaitanya. And he's writing over there, all my God brothers are in Mayapur or in Vrindavan, and they will be celebrating Gaur Purnima. And I'm all alone over here. You know, what, what to do? And at that time, Prabhupada didn't even have followers, uh, any followers whom he could tell. But Prabhupada says that, you know, this is, I'm fulfilling the mission of Mahaprabhu. That is why I'm there over here. So Prabhupada had that conviction that people from any background would become devotees. And when the people started taking, uh, when his followers started taking the, the process of bhakti, he not only encouraged them to practice bhakti, but he encouraged them to become leaders. To become leaders, you know, in 1968 when Prabhupada came back, he fell sick once, so he had to come to India for healing himself, and he came back to America. So the devotees received him, and at that time, Prabhupada had a globe in his 
uh, globe of the globe of the earth in his room so all his early disciples were there and prabhupad said to them it's all of you pick one one country go there and deliver that country Just pick one country and go there and in jadurani mata ji was there prabhupad said she she asked prabhupad what about us girls he says we are not boys or girls we are not men or women we are souls you also pick one country <laughs> you also pick one country so that was prabhupad spirit and prabhupad encouraged and empowered his disciples to also not just practice bhakti but to infuse bhakti in others mm -hmm. there's uh, one academic scholar who has written about the the transform or the transformation of the hari krishna movement so he says that initially in the first generation when prabhupad brought western disciples to india his western disciples were seen more as you could say i don't want these are his words i'll just repeat them but he says they were specimens of the glory of indian culture nobody saw them as spiritual teachers hmm that they you know oh our culture is so great that even these western people are taking it up but what has happened is this is that bhaktivedant swami making western people or inspiring western people to practice his bhakti is remarkable but what is even more remarkable is that his followers who were initially simply treated as like specimens of the glory of indian culture they became teachers of indian culture and in wisdom to indians and indians accepted that so he said that they are not only respected but highly venerated considered to be venerated teachers and spiritualists and saints so this is a demonstration of the revolutionary effect of mahaprabhu's teachings that somebody who was either considered outcast or considered okay just that they are now considered teachers this is the glory of the transformation that mahaprabhu can bring about and no other tradition has done that many other traditions went to the west and maybe made people followers but this is something which mahaprabhu has done in a very mahaprabhu's tradition is distinctive and yes there are in today's world there are many social evils there are political problems but ultimately all problems will be solved through the elevation of consciousness so the discriminatory caste system religious intolerance we may feel oh, all these problems we have to do something to deal with it yes there is a kshatriya level of measures that have to be taken to deal with this problems at a kshatriya level but ultimately the problems will be solved only by the raising of consciousness and the most powerful resource for the raising of consciousness in the entire universe is provided by mahaprabhu through the chanting of the holy names through the cultivation of the remembrance of krishna through the experience of rasa in relationship with krishna anyone and everyone can raise their consciousness and that inner raising of consciousness that transformation of the heart that is the foundation for a sustainable change in the world so sometimes we may be gripped by the problems in the world and we feel i have to do something about it yes if we have the resources if we have the position we can act at a kshatriya level but if that is not there's no need to get tormented over the problems and become distracted from bhakti ultimately kshatriya level solutions are not sustainable it is only brahmana level solutions that are sustainable now i am not minimizing kshatriya level solutions they are important but without transformation of the heart no system will be sustained so yes creating systems for protection for other things are important but ultimately no system will be better than the people who are running the system and the, we'll have better people running the system only when there is purification of the heart so that is mahaprabhu's great mercy that he has given us all opportunity to become transformed to become empowered to become purified and thus become agents of change mahaprabhu's mission and it's not something which just happened historically say 500 years ago mahaprabhu appeared mahaprabhu's mission is going on today and each one of us has an opportunity to be a part of the mission of mahaprabhu you know mahaprabhu has had stalwart commanders and stalwart warriors in his army but the nature of life in the material world is that every generation requires people from that generation to transmit the message of bhakti the previous acharyas are all great 
and they are great inspiration for us but to share bhakti in this generation it requires people from this generation the previous acharyas are not literally going to come again and share bhakti in this generation so it is for us to do that and we all can pray to mahaprabhu that he bless us with a drop of his mercy so that we can become purified and we can carry on his legacy his glorious legacy that can transform the world that can transform our hearts and that can transform the world through our transformed hearts shri gauranga mahaprabhu ki shri la prabhu pad ki shri gaur purnima mahamahotsav ki itai gaur premanande